G'day guys, Jazz here and welcome to another video. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about radiology fellowships. I'm gonna go through the various types of fellowships, what they briefly entail, and then go through whether or not I think they're useful and whether or not you should do one. So firstly, what is a fellowship? A fellowship is a period of further subspecialization, which can be undertaken once you've completed your core kind of registrar training or completed your residency. So at this point in time, you are considered a fully qualified radiologist. But some people have, you know, certain interests or, you know, a certain type of imaging that they find quite interesting and useful and want to learn a bit more about it, then you can undertake a fellowship. So fellowships typically run over either one to two years, I would say majority are probably 12 months, but depending on uh, which one you pick, which I'll go through later, some can be a bit longer. So then at the end of your training, you can apply to a subspecialty fellowship training program anywhere around the world. Um, you know, keeping in mind that different countries will have different requirements. For example, if you want to go do your fellowship in America, you will have to do the USMLE, regardless of whether you're fully qualified or not. So that's just something to be mindful of. And then you undertake this uh, period of further subspecialty training uh, under the direct supervision, usually of uh, a few uh, subspecialists in that area. Um, and depending on which facility you go to. All right, so now we'll look into what kind of fellowships you can actually do in radiology and the different types of subspecialties. So we'll start with number one, which is abdominal imaging or body imaging. So as the name suggests, it is a fellowship where you train uh, and learn a bit more about the actual body, uh, whether that includes the, you know, the core body organs, but it also includes the pelvic organs, so the reproductive systems, the genitourinary systems, and obviously the GI tract. So particular skills that uh, body fellowship trainees will learn include stuff like uh, MRI of the prostate, uh, MRI of the rectum, say for staging of rectal cancer, uh, MRI enterography, uh, liver screening MRIs, uh, you know, for HCCs, and then also female pelvic MRI. So particularly including, you know, MRI to assess for, you know, endometrial cancer, cervical cancer, but then also for other, say, you know, infiltrating processes such as endometriosis. All right, the next fellowship is number two, and that's breast imaging. So breast imaging fellowship usually encompasses all aspects of breast imaging, including digital mammography, synthesis, ultrasound, breast MRI, and of course, interventional procedures to do with the breast as well, such as lesion localization, theory tactic, and ultrasound guided core biopsies of various breast lesions, fine needle aspirations, cyst aspirations, ductography, and then on top of that also MRI guided biopsies, which are also performed at certain facilities. Now, given how much breast imaging is performed in the outpatient setting, and I'm not sure about where you're watching this from, but Australia has uh, like breast screen clinics as well. So there is a big demand for people to uh, do breast imaging. And given the, you know, the consequences for, you know, misreporting or missing breast cancers, given that it's such a big, uh, big thing that, and obviously you don't want to be one of those people that misses anything and doing this kind of extra training just is a very useful skill to have just to give yourself confidence uh, if you do work in that outpatient setting where you do have to report breast imaging. Okay, number three is chest and cardiac imaging fellowship. So as the name suggests, you become a subspecialist or an expert in imaging of the chest and the Huh? Most programs that you will usually do one of these fellowships at will allow you to kind of pick what you want your focus to be, whether you want to do more cardiac stuff or you want to do more to do with, you know, lung disease itself. Uh, as far as I know, most programs will be a bit flexible. You'll probably have to cover both topics, but you can probably pick, say, I want to be focused more on, you know, lung diseases, so I'd like to do a bit more of that than the cardiac and vice versa as well. So from the cardiac perspective, there'll be a lot of cardiac MRI and they'll usually be in the context of varying indications such as congenital heart disease, cardiomyopathies, viability MRI, and then valvular diseases. There are also usually a big focus and a big volume of uh, CT coronary angiograms, which are performed everywhere. So picking up those skills, you'll usually get enough volume to be accredited for CTCA um, in whichever country you're practicing in, which is a huge benefit. And then the chest component will usually focus on a spectrum of interstitial lung diseases, as well as other common diffuse and rare lung diseases. And then there will also be a focus on lung cancers. Now, given that you will be doing a lot of imaging to do with lung cancer, that uh, you know, gives the opportunity to practice your CT guided lung biopsy skills. So having that you know, substantial amount of volume and getting, you know, 
more easy biopsies to you know very complex biopsies that will definitely improve your confidence in that regard as well all right the next fellowship we're talking about is musculoskeletal imaging or msk imaging now the focus of this fellowship will really depend on what type of facility that you're working at whether it's a you know a high-end tertiary hospital or you're actually doing it in the private practice setting the focus could either be on you know joint mri uh, sports medicine and injuries uh, rheumatology or tumors as well and that includes either you know bone tumors or soft tissue tumors now some facilities might also have a good exposure to pediatric imaging but then again it comes down to which facility you're working at msk uh, fellowships also have a significant uh, procedural workload whether that be you know ultrasound guided or ct guided intervention and common procedures could include uh, joint arthrograms uh, steroid injections injections into you know various joints uh, around the body uh, bone biopsies and then also radiofrequency ablation which can be done on you know certain bone lesions or on uh, nerves themselves. Okay, the next fellowship we're gonna talk about is neuroradiology. Now these fellowships can either just be purely neuro, include just mainly brain stuff, but a lot of them will have a bit of head and neck uh, stuff combined into it as well. So again, like I said, it will depend on what facility you go to, but most of the programs will have kind of an outline of their curriculum, you know, when you're applying. Now these fellowships will kind of include all aspects of neuroradiology, as well as kind of spinal procedures, uh, neurograms, pediatric neuroradiology, uh, functional MRI, spectroscopy, uh, MRI angiograms, and like I said before, whatever component of head and neck radiology they include in the curriculum. Now, it should also be noted that neuroradiology is probably one of the more academic subspecialties. So a lot of these programs will have some sort of research component also included. That's not always, but it is something that I've seen a lot of. And again, like this will kind of be outlined within the curriculum or the um, the statement provided by the facility for the fellowship. Next, we have interventional radiology. Now, this will usually include a full spectrum of either vascular or non-vascular procedures, which could include angiography, uh, percutaneous uh, angioplasties and stenting, uh, embolizations, uh, percutaneous uh, tumor treatments, such as taste, thrombolysis, uh, you know, various gastric and ga uh, hepatobiliary interventions, uh, genitourinary interventions, you know, say a nephrostomy, various things to do with transplant patients, uh, you know fistulas in you know dialysis patients uh, drainages of all sorts so sclerotherapy which would be venous interventions and also a large component will be the various types of vascular accesses so the different types of lines and ports and all that kind of stuff that uh, a lot of long-term hospital patients will require now if that's not enough procedures for you then you can also do further training with another like year or two after doing an interventional radiology fellowship and become a neurointerventional specialist um, and that will train you even further to be able to do further vascular or neurovascular procedures whether that be you know clot retrieval in stroke patients or you know management management of intracranial aneurysms and all that kind of stuff so if you're, that's your kind of uh, interest, then that's also available. And that's something that you'll have to spend quite a few years doing uh, as, a, as a fellow to become competent, given that it's such a highly technical field. Now, the next fellowship we have is nuclear medicine. Now, this fellowship in Australia is usually two years and it does involve exams because there is a certain, you know, nuclear medicine physicians kind of uh, sub college uh, or college, sorry, if I offended anyone by calling it a sub college, but requires further exams and passing all of those on top of your two years of nuclear medicine training. Now, the Nuclear Medicine Fellowship will kind of cover all your typical uh, diagnostic nuclear medicine tests and then also like nuclear cardiology testing and then also includes, you know, learning how to report PET CT or PET MRI. And then you also get a bit of learning and insight into theranostics, which is like the uh, therapeutic use of radioisotopes in treating various conditions. So I believe that's a part of the curriculum as well when you become familiar with something like that. But as I mentioned before, that there are certain exams to do with this fellowship. Most of the other fellowships in Australia don't have any formal exams that you have to do, uh, whereas nuclear medicine does. Now, lastly, we've made it to the end of the list, pediatric imaging. Now, this fellowship, it's explained in the name. Uh, it's just to do with all facets of imaging for children. So whether that's uh, pediatric imaging through fluoroscopy, ultrasound, x-ray, MRI. But uh, given that, I know at least in Australia and probably a lot of other area, uh, places to train that you do get some exposure to pediatric imaging during your training as a bit of a core requirement. But doing this fellowship, obviously a lot more exposure, more responsibility and getting more comfortable, particularly with fluoroscopy, uh, pediatric procedures, such as you know upper GI studies, all that kind of stuff. So that will help you to become confident with that. So guys, that wraps up the various uh, fellowships that you can do as a radiologist and all the different subspecialties and a little insight into what they're about and what you'd be expected to do or learn. Now, the last question really comes down to, do I think you need to do a fellowship and would I recommend one? 
I guess firstly, you don't need to do a fellowship in radiology. It is one of those specialties, at least at the moment, where you can uh, walk into a consultant job without having a fellowship. Uh, it does it look favorable? Yes, it does, because it shows that you're you know, kind of showing a bit of extra commitment, a bit of extra training, put in a little bit more effort uh, into uh, you know, upskilling yourself, and you can obviously provide a bit more value to your future employer having those subspecialty skills. And then do I think you should do one? Uh, I would probably say yes, you should try and do one. Again, it kind of depends on what your personal circumstance is. Uh, being a fellow is another year of, you know, taking a salary at the level of a registrar as opposed to uh, the amount of money you could earn as a consultant or an attending. So that's something to consider depending on what your family and personal circumstance is. But from a learning point of view, it is good. It increases your employability, your skills. And then on top of that, it also makes you more confident as well. Now, like I said, there are certain things during training that you might only have brushed up on slightly superficially and then you might end up seeing a lot more of it when you're a specialist. Um, but then having upskilled a little bit in that, then it makes you feel a bit more confident. By no means am I saying that you'll be a full expert in whatever subspecialty you decide to do. Uh, you know, keeping in mind that you really are only doing the extra training for about 12 months um, or maybe a bit more and that's not usually enough time to become a full expert. It will take years of you know, extra work and uh, you know, reporting large volumes of those cases to be a, a true expert, but it does help you, you know, have a little bit more knowledge, feel a bit better and more comfortable in your reporting. So that's why I would recommend doing one. Now guys, if you like the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.